wrote this for you, for the ones searching for Jesus, for the ones who found him but are growing weary of his misrepresentations, for the ones whose faith is holding on by a thread, and for you, the ones who know that it is the Lord Jesus Christ who is right now sitting at the right hand of the Father, ruling and reigning in the hearts of his people. That Jesus changes everything. He is the threat to all that threatens us. He will not be canceled. He will not be defeated. And he will not share his name with imposters. This Jesus brings revival. This Jesus is dangerous. Yeah, crossover family, let's give it up for Dangerous Jesus. Yeah. Good to have you guys with us today. Last Sunday on Resurrection Sunday, we kicked off this brand new series, Dangerous Jesus, because uh, the real Jesus many times has been hijacked, right? I mean, Jesus is like the most observed figure ever in history, but yet many times the most misinterpreted, reinterpreted hijacked because all these people put their agenda on top of Jesus. And so we've been going through the book. We're kicking it off. It's been, it's been really good, dangerous Jesus. And KB in the book talks about some different kind of imposter Jesuses. And so we talked a little bit about that last week, uh, the political Jesus. Some people follow that one like, oh, the Jesus that's more about changing laws and legislation than he is about changing hearts. Or the weak Jesus that, that's just like, hide your kids, hide your wife. Like, run, run, run away from culture. You, you don't want to, like, like, Jesus was weak. Or patriot Jesus. Like, it's all about America, all about America. Like, America's in the center of the universe. Or there's some people that believe, like, winning Jesus. Like, Jesus is connected, the presence of God is connected with success and with money and, and very little talking about suffering. Or I threw this one in there, social justice Jesus. Like, it's all about just giving stuff away, that kind of Jesus. But there's never any, like, real challenge, or there's never challenge to be righteous or to share the gospel. There's some people that get caught up in that Jesus. Or over-spiritual Jesus that is just, like, uh, downplays counseling or therapy or medicine. And it's like all those Jesuses, if you know the real Jesus, those are the imposter versions, y'all. And, and we got to show people the, the real Jesus because the, the Christianity of the land has turned Christianity into something that it's not. And so this series, this book, it fits perfectly with Crossover Church's theme for 2023. Help me out with our theme, y'all. What is it? Rebrand. Rebrand. That, that's the, the word, the theme that God put on our heart for 2023 to change the narrative about the church. And who is the church? Us. Us. We are. If you have a relationship with Jesus, I am the church. You are the church. We are the church. And we've been, some of us have been messed up. And we've been following some of the imposter Jesuses and given the wrong view. And it's time that, that we come back to the real Jesus and we learn to live dangerous Christianity and follow that dangerous Jesus. So we kicked this off last Sunday. How many of y'all were here last Sunday? Make some noise. It was beautiful. <laughs> Celebrated the resurrection. And I just want to celebrate for a minute because last Sunday was Crossover Church's largest Sunday in our church history ever. Yeah. I mean, listen, I know this is the 1145 service, y'all, but we added an 830 a.m. service, and we weren't sure if anyone was going to show up at that service. We had almost 350 people come at 830 last Sunday, and that created just enough space because 10 o'clock and 1145 were, were packed, and we had, eight, we had 83 families come to Crossover for the very first time, so that was awesome. But the thing, y'all, that gets us the most excited is we had 140 people respond to the gospel and stand up and walk out of the room and go to the prayer room. And we got their information. We followed up with them this week. And today we're going to have a party at the end of service, y'all. We're going to have a party. Uh, we love to baptize people here. That's the public display of your following Jesus, the biblical public display. And so we love to celebrate. So there's a bunch of people that signed up to get baptized today. And some of you are going to get baptized. You didn't even know it, but just wait. So uh, <laughs> it's going to be a party at the end of service. And so, hey, the next five weeks, we're going to continue this series on KB's book. So I encourage you guys to stick around. But I'm super excited uh, for today. Somebody say today. today. On today. 
We got a brother with us today that he's family. He was part of Crossover for, for six years. Uh, I had the opportunity back in the day to, to, to officiate the wedding uh, between him and his wife. My little girl was a flower girl. She's about to be 20 now, Michelle. Can you believe that? Oh, my goodness. So, but, uh, so he's family, y'all. He got roots here. So Crossover family, I want y'all to stand to your feet. Make some crazy noise. Give a great welcome to our brother, K, to the second letter. Hey, B. Yeah. Family. Family, family, family. Morning, morning, morning. We feeling all right? Afternoon. Afternoon, afternoon, afternoon. We feeling all right? Yeah. Amen, amen. It's a grace, a gift, a privilege, an honor to be with you today. And in some ways, I'm a guest today. I, I, think, ways, I think your mic, I think your mic went off. Well, well my voice okay, is just loud, so we we folks, folks, is that, we, we here? We, we rocking? We got you, we got you. Okay, amen. In some ways, I'm a guest, but in other ways, this is just me coming home, okay? Uh, I do want to take a moment and honor Pastor Tommy. Uh, not only, amen, amen. Uh, not only was Pastor Tommy instrumental in uh, the start of my career, I would not have met the record label that I was signed to first without Pastor Tommy making the uh, connection. So my children's college fund thanks you for that, okay? <laughs> Flavor Fest 2008. Flavor Fest 2008. Yep. But in addition to that, uh, this is, Pastor Tommy is among the first men to disciple me, to bring me in, pour the word of God into my life and help direct me. The years that I was here formed me into the man that I am today. And I am in debt forever because of it. Uh, yeah. Bro, we're so proud of you. Um, you are one of our own. You're not just from our city, but you have roots here in our church. And, yeah. and I can proudly announce he is a best-selling author now. Yeah. Like the book, the book is doing incredible, and God is using it in so many ways. And I can just say I remember when you first stepped into the old campus, sat uh -huh. all the way like in the back against the wall. Yeah. Had a little chip on your shoulder. A little, a little chip. bit. You, you had went through some church hurt. And uh -huh. you're like, what is this church about? Uh -huh. like, like, what's up with this? Yeah. But just to see, man, like how God has used you and grown you. Now you're, you're an author, podcaster, entrepreneur, of course, uh, an award-winning artist. But you're so much more than just a rapper. You know? Thank you, and so, uh, yeah. man, we just want to honor you today. We're glad to be doing this series. So, so let's dive in, man. Let's, let's talk about the book, man. Yes, indeed. What, what was like the overview passion of why Danger is Jesus? Yeah. Um... And my mom is in the house tonight in the front row, God, yes, I mean, mom. this afternoon. And uh, along with my lovely wife and two boys. Um, I had to say that because she uh, does not like when I have bottles of water on the table. She wants to see my face. So I, I took the, <laughs> put the water water down. I love you, mama. Um, I went with the title, Dangerous Jesus. Because I think that that word houses um, a kind of reality that I think is important for us to reflect on when we think about who God is. Um, in the uh, arena of sports, typically when you think about somebody that's really good at a particular sport, we use words to describe them that are in context of what they mean for the other side, for the enemy, for the team that's against them. Like, she is a threat, or that dude is a problem, or yeah. what he just did was nasty, or nasty to the other team, because the other team has to deal with this force that's on the field, in the ring, or on the court. And as I think about the Lord Jesus Christ, what we have embodied perfectly in the Son of God is one who comes into the world who is so good, so merciful, so powerful, so strong that he becomes a threat to all of the yeah. things that the kingdom of darkness yeah. would threaten us with. <clears throat> that, that this Jesus, his very existence was so problematic. The good was so good that it was scary. It put fear in people. They wanted to get rid of him. But here's the thing about a dangerous Jesus. You can't put down the son of God. Three days later, he is back up reigning and ruling forever. Yes. And what that does for those who follow him is that it it invites us into the same kind of spirit, the same vibe, the same flavor 
that this Jesus, that when he is around, darkness is on notice, uh, evil is pushed back, back against, darkness becomes, uh, uh, gets on its heel and runs. And if that's how Jesus is, that's the goal for his people. That we would be the kind of dangerous people that when we are around, evil is pushed back against, slander ends, healing happens, people are lifted, people are loved. And to get back to that kind of world changing, um, not easily uh, put away or forgotten kind of Christian faith means everything. For revival in this country, revival in our hearts, yeah. revival in our churches. Now, that I am a rapper too. I do a little hippity dippity, all right? <laughs> There's also, as I mentioned in that word dangerous, a double entendre. Because on the other side of the word dangerous is the more traditional way in which we understand it something that hurts. What we have found and what we've seen almost explode over the last six years is that oftentimes people claiming the name of Jesus do more to hurt the world than the world itself. Let me put it to you like this. A gentleman that was trying to read a, a Christian author, philosopher to, to, to faith many years ago, C.S. Lewis, he received this letter from this, 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 uh, a friend of his, and the friend was trying to explain Christianity to him, and he said, man, the best evidence that Jesus is who he is, is the way Christians live their lives. When you see their joy, their love, their grace, but he also said, the worst evidence, or the most discrediting evidence, mm -hmm. is also the way Christians live their lives. When you find people of hypocrisy and, 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 and narrow, not theologically, but narrow in the way that they care for folks. When you find people that have no joy, they have no, no, no passions, they are just stuck in their little silo. And that's all there is. When you find people naming the name of Jesus, yet they are not actually looking, experiencing and loving Jesus. You find something that actually is bad for the world. This personified, um, Pastor Tommy already alluded to it last week and also before he brought me up. It's persona, or excuse me, it's explained in the works of one of my favorite people in American history, uh, the, the, the revolutionary uh, Frederick Douglass. Frederick Douglass lived in the antebellum South during slavery. He was a slave. And he mentioned how slaves would often pray that their master did not find God. Because oftentimes when their master found God or became religious, they became more harsh. They, they became people who uh, were, were, were more intolerant and a heavy task master. He mentioned watching his slave owner, um, uh, the man who had enslaved him, Thomas Old, uh, beat a person into an inch of their life, then go into the house and do devotions with their family. He escapes out of that and he goes to the north. And this is a good word for us. Because when he gets to the north and, and he's beginning to write and come into sort of a notoriety across the land, he does not abandon Christianity. He doesn't give Christianity to the people who are abusing him and people like him in Jesus' name. He says, no, 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 no. They actually don't know Jesus. The, the, the issue here, here is that in every generation, there's something called the Christianity of the land, a Christianity that, is, that flows out of the imagination of the people, that they are trying to make Jesus into their image instead of having Jesus make them into his image. And when that happens, it becomes a problem. It becomes a, 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 an oppressive force. We can't be reconciled in that context. We can't be lifted. We can't be empowered in that context. And what Frederick Douglass says is that he hates that Christianity, but there is the pure, peaceable, world-changing, uh, oppression-lifting, wound-healing, sinner-forgiving Christianity of Christ yeah. that stands in distinction to that, and it is on the people of God with all their might for the yeah. sake of the yeah. world to give yeah. themselves. To that Christianity. Yeah. Man, I, I love 
uh, how you laid everything out in this book. And uh, every chapter is a dangerous fill in the blank. Like yeah. Dangerous faith, yeah. dangerous gospel, dangerous citizen, yeah. dangerous justice, blessing, speech, spirit. But, but in particular, I want to land for a couple minutes and, and talk about uh, dangerous love. Mm. And yeah. that, that's one that hits me. I know you, you love it as well. Yeah. Um, we just showed a video a couple minutes ago yeah. about love our city. Yeah. And that's a big part of our, our passion. One of our core values at Crossover yeah. is to love our city and love our community and, and give back. And so let, let's talk about that chapter for a yeah, little bit, man, about sure. that dangerous love. And Amen. what does that really mean? Because Christians, a lot of times, we got that mixed up, man. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm with you, brother. I'm with you, pastor. Um, yeah, that's an important chapter for me. It was recalibrating. It brought me to the reality of the gospel, the reality of walking with God. That, you know, my baby girl Nala is in children's church right now, and um, I take her to the beach. And uh, at the beach, she's three, by the way, uh, I feel no fear having her at the shore as long as daddy's with her. She's on the shore, she's playing in the water. I can say she's in the ocean. But just because her feet are in the ocean, maybe if it comes up to her waist, uh, we have to always remember that there's way more out there. In fact, the deeper you go, the more complex life becomes. In fact, marine biologists say that we've only discovered a small portion of the depth of the ocean. That in a lot of ways, the gospel's like that. So the, the, the gospel is such that the shores, when it, it's simple enough, it's, it's easy to understand enough that a baby can play at its shore and be unhurt, uh, not be harmed, but it's deep enough and challenging enough that it could drown an elephant. It's both simple and deep. And what we see in the New Testament around this concept of love, brothers and sisters, is that in God's prescription to who we should be, what kind of people should we be? When you, if, you, if, if, our, if there was a, a profile of your life, you talk about who you are, the thing you cared about the most. What should that read if you're following God? The New Testament in no uncertain terms says that we are first lovers of God and lovers of each other. That is core to what it means to follow Jesus. Jesus gives the command. Pastor Tommy already alluded to it as well. This passage where he says that when, when he's being questioned, what, how do you sum up? What's the, most, what's the most important laws? And Jesus says that the law of laws is to love God with all your heart, all your mind, all your strength. But then he says that the second commandment is like the first, yep. right? Equal. And we Equal. often forget that is that he's saying the order is important. You love God and it qualifies your love for other people. But sometimes you can get wild in your love for people and end up hurting them, okay? Mm -hmm. You want to have a love for God that guides your love for people. But what Jesus is saying, that loving God uh, is, is the first commandment, and like it, the second is love each other, is that if you are not a lover of your neighbor and the lover of the saints of God, you cannot love the living God. You can't say that I love God, but I don't love people. Yeah. That can't happen. Yeah. Yeah. That's the simple piece. Let me say one more point about the simple piece. In Revelation chapter 2, you have the church of Ephesus, right? The church of Ephesus is killing it, right? They standing for truth. They preaching the gospel. Everybody's jumping and singing during service. Things are going well. It is a popping church. Jesus talks about how they don't let nobody just come in there and preach whatever they want. They stand down false prophets. Jesus even, uh, the, the text mentions, uh, and some theologians believe that the actual people that they were standing against saying that y'all can't come in here, it's going to sound very familiar. It was a group of people that believed funny things about sex and sexuality. They stood against those people. Mm -hmm. And Jesus said, good job. I agree with you. But I got this one thing against you. Now, and I, and, I, and I said this in the first service, and I'll say it again. Normally, when you affirm somebody, you're just building them up like, man, you're doing a great, great job. And then at the end, you say, but I need you to correct this one little thing. It's normally not like a, a, a crazy, heavy thing. It's like, listen, man, you, you, you work on time. I really appreciate that. I, I love the ways in which you, you made coffee for the whole team last week. I love that. But could you just turn the lights off? At, you know, you, you're running up the light bill, and I, I can't play that. I'm from the hood. I, you got to make sure the lights get turned off. You know what I'm saying? 
But Jesus doesn't do that. He affirms them, affirms them, affirms them, and affirms them. And then the last thing he says is that if you don't fix this thing, I will shut down your whole operation. He says the thing that you are missing is that you have abandoned your first love. Jesus is so serious about love in his people for him and others that Jesus says that if your church isn't marked by love for God and people, it shouldn't exist. That says in no uncertain terms that who we are to be the biggest project of our lives, because I don't know if you're like me, it's not always a natural inclination to do the loving thing. Yes, yes. But the project of our lives, that we would accomplish more here in love than anywhere else. God is not going to be impressed with how organized your ministry was. He's not going to be impressed by how, uh, how, how you were able to, to move up the ranks at work. God is not moved by your accolades. He's moved by your simple love and your commitment to grow in that love. That's the easy part. Now, here's the deep part. Understanding that, hearing it and affirming it is easy. The elephant drowning part, the ocean deep part, is when you get opportunities and the opportunity is saying, don't love. When you get opportunities, even within the church and other things are being emphasized. We saw six years ago, people that we had started this, this, this journey with that had to poured into me. My best friend, I mean, is also in the audience here today. We do Southside Rabbi together, um, our podcast. Yeah, it makes noise for me in the dream. Me and Machine, he cannot be defeated or deleted. Um, we watch people who we would run into the battlefield with, stand on the block with, get in front of danger with in, in pursuit of the gospel politicize their entire faith mm -hmm. when the thing that they want to be known by is not how they love their enemies. And I'm, and I'm, and I'm, and I'm talking to believers right now. They didn't want to be known by the love that they had for people that disagreed with them. They wanted to be known by who they voted for. Brothers and sisters, what we believe is important. Listening to good preaching is important. Standing on truth is important. But Jesus is saying to us very clearly that if that is the thing that you want to be identified by, is the person that is just very articulate, that knows all their truths, and does, is, is narrow not only in their theology, but they're narrow in their love and generosity to people, you have missed the essentiality of Christianity. What it means yeah. to follow yeah. Jesus is to give yourself to love for God that is demonstrated in your love for people. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. So you talk about Luke chapter 10, one of my favorite chapters in here, and that's when Jesus was challenged by that religious leader yeah. that said, who is my neighbor? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? So like he wanted some exceptions, but I want to cross some people out on the list. I love what you said on page 102. Uh, you said, this is not to say so that we can or should fight all the battles of the present uh, evil age. Yeah. There's a lot of problems in the world, right? Like we could be overwhelmed. Like right. where do I start? Oh my gosh, there's so much. But we have a unique obligation to fight the battles of our neighbors. Yes. Those that are around us. We do for our neighbors what we wish we could do for the whole world. Yes. So what does that mean, crossover family? We start right here. Yeah. With our neighbors. Yeah. Right here in Uptown Tampa, right here in, in Riverview and Brandon and downtown and West Tampa and Carrollwood and Land of Lakes and Newport Ritchie and wherever you live. We got, mm. We're a regional church. That's good. We got people that live all over. You start with, man, what are, what are the needs of yes. my neighbors that are right around me? Even if I don't agree with them, even if they have a bumper sticker yes. of somebody that I don't, you know, they, yes. they, they, I just, I'm still going to love them. Yeah. And, and I want to say this too. You, you said this on page 100. Let us not love in word or speech because it's so easy to do that, right? Yes. We, we could talk a good game, yeah. uh, but in action and in truth. Yes. Because help me out. Actions speak louder than what? Words. And words. And KB, you told this story in this chapter, man. Yeah. That, uh, you know, I got a lot of respect for you, but when I read that one, I was like, ooh, brother, yeah, that was a tough one, man. <laughs> I got, they were, it notched up a little bit. And so KB's a boxing fan. Yep. And uh, he regularly has uh, 
fight parties. Uh -huh. you know, me, I, me and Amin, I've been at some of the fight parties where, yeah. like, he, you know, we watch the fight uh -huh. together. And so he had an opportunity as a boxing fan, a uh, brother named Andre Ward, uh -huh. had an opportunity to walk out in front of him and rap and do a song in front of millions of people on pay-per-view. Yeah. But, but tell him what happened, man. Well, <laughs> that one still burns a little bit. Um, and, and yeah, just to reiterate that, boxing is my favorite sport. I basically don't even follow any other sport besides yeah. boxing. And I, he boxes. I, be, I got a little, you know what I'm saying? got some little, hands. Watch you out. Know Watch out. You know what I'm saying? Um, yeah, so Andre Ward is, is Michael Jordan to me. It, 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 I, if I met Michael Jordan, it would not mean as much as meeting Andre Ward. And I, I did get to meet Andre Ward. Mm -hmm. And um, in fact, I, I think there might even be a story in the book. I mean, I didn't put in the book about the first time I met Andre Ward, how I, it, I was with him for two days, and it took me all of those days to feel normal around him. I didn't know how to sit down. I was <laughs> like where I put my hands. I was asking stupid questions, you know. I was just nervous. Uh, blah, blah, blah. Anyways. He's fanboying. I was fanboying, and I had never done I've been around a bunch of famous people, and I, all of them I saw them as humans, but I saw him as something else for some reason. Anyways, Andre Ward is an undefeated fighter, Olympic gold medalist, but also a serious follower of Jesus, like ministering in his interviews, ministering to other fighters, just a man, no scandals, loved his wife and his family through his whole career. It's just a good picture. Showtime is doing a, um, doing a, a, a documentary. They're putting a documentary out on him. I believe Showtime is doing it. Anyways, Andre Ward hit me up with my greatest dream. The Super Bowl wouldn't mean as much as getting to walk him to the ring. And, but the day that the fight was happening was the same day that I was booked to go rap at some youth group in the middle of America with about 100 people. So we tried to reach out to them and say, hey, man, listen. <laughs> I said, hey, I said, I will literally, I, I, will, I will come for, for free the next day. <laughs> Please let your boy off the hook. And they said, you're under contract. Yeah. Our people are looking forward to you. They have been, we've been hyping this up all year. We really think that you need to come. Wow. And I was like, say less. Yeah. I'll be there. And in that moment, I felt like the spirit, no, let's be clear, this didn't feel good. <laughs> but it was good. And I had to turn down my hero. And I went and I served those people in the middle of America in front of 100 people. And I watched the fight backstage on my cell phone instead of ringside. And actually, the truth went in my, in my place, so I had to watch him go. I wasn't jealous at all. <laughs> um, <laughs> but brothers and sisters, what that said to me is, I had to ask, my, ask myself a question, a question. I have friends, good friends who I respect, that, that still call me an idiot to this day for not doing that. They, and they have, on many occasions, said, well, I just won't be there. You know, I'm going to, to, to do the thing. But what I want to be in this world, more than taking to my boys who are not listening to me right now, I love you boys, <laughs> what I want them to see is a man who didn't just come home with some opportunity that I got to be in front of a whole bunch of people. Yeah. I want to show them a man that is working a muscle of discipline that chooses the way of love and integrity yeah. over yeah. opportunity and his success. That's full. That's complete. That's who I want to be. That's what I believe God is calling us to in the way of dangerous love. Yeah, man. Yeah. That's good, bro. Yeah. Listen, sometimes when we make decisions like that and we do the right thing, it hurts a little bit. And in that moment, it doesn't always feel good. It's not happy. But we can still have joy. Amen. Amen. Happiness is based on what's happening at that moment. <clears throat> But joy is something that God gives us inside, no matter what the circumstances yeah, are yeah, around yeah. us. And so that's one of my other favorite chapters yep. in the book, the joy chapter. Ah. And I love joy. I'm, I'm a joyful person. I'm optimistic. I love to be around optimistic people. And, yeah. and we vibe together and connect. That's why a lot of times we start talking about this is going on. Oh, that's going on. Uh -huh. You know what I'm saying? Joy is one of my favorite songs right now that Amen. I'm listening to. That's the title of it. By King's Kaleidoscope. Go look King's it up. King's Kaleidoscope. It's nice. not even hip hop. He knows. It's not. It's like an eclectic, soulful vibe. I, I got turned Beast. on to them recently. They're, they're dope. 
But uh, let's talk about the joy chapter for a couple minutes. Dangerous yeah. joy. Yeah. Yes, indeed. Um, I, um, if I could have extended one chapter into a whole book, yeah. it would have been dangerous joy. Because I think we have to first remember the words of Paul when he says that Satan is the God of this world, right? But I think that we don't take all of what Paul is saying because he says that in context that though Satan is indeed the God of this world, uh, the living God is God over Satan, okay? And that his glory fills the earth. What, 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 what God is intending for you and me is that we can walk through every square inch of this world and see echoes and, 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 and sort of sprinkles. You see his fingerprint of his presence and his goodness that we can enjoy God in his word. That's what we're taught, which is great. Enjoy God in his word. See wonderful things about what he has done and how the word of God connects to your life. That is beautiful. But make no mistake. Joy, satisfaction, pleasure in the context that he ordains. Okay, your ability to have fun when you come to Jesus, that isn't the end of all those things. God doesn't end your joy. He extends and protects your joy. Because what we see is in the Garden of Eden that there is a single tree that Adam and Eve are told not to eat from. But we forget that there's an entire garden that was intended to extend to the world that was filled with not simply lectures or prayer services, amen to that, Um, but it's filled with fruit. Mm -hmm. When you bite into it, it's sweet. Mm -hmm. The taste buds jump for joy. God intends for you to use the good things in this world to teach you about the good God that made it. And if we become the people that spend all of our time roping our Christianity away from the world, we, we, we spend our, our, I mean, it described it as, um, as uh, sorry, I didn't give you credit for this in the book. Sorry, Measy. But <laughs> I mean, described it like Christians being like we're on the walking dead, right? That everybody in the world is sick and dying and, 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 they're, and they're affected with something. And what we do is we spend our time in our little silo, in our little camp. And then every now and then one of us will leave the camp and go into town to get some supplies to rush back and don't let them touch you while you're out. Mm. That's not the world that the Bible talks about. The world that the Bible talks about is filled with wonder and joy and pleasure that you should not feel shameful about enjoying. Me and Amin had a two-hour conversation uh, just a couple days ago about enjoying good fashion. That you put on a shirt or some jeans that you in good stewardship purchased. And you like the way that it looked. Do you realize that the first outfit was crafted by God coming out of the garden? The Lord clothed them. And what I'm saying to you is that there is nothing that you enjoy in this world if it is considered good, beautiful, or praiseworthy that you can't give glory for and be happy to enjoy it. Bring that. Let me say this last thing. Yes. Brothers and sisters, there is no shortage of suffering in this world. You will have trouble. You will cry. You will weep. You will be confused. And the confidence that we have is even when we're not all high-fiving and celebrating some good thing, that even in the darkness, the light is in us. Oh, the darkness might be around us, but the light is in us. You don't need to accelerate your suffering by withholding yourself from a good time if that good time pleases the Lord. And that's what I'm saying. We need to be the kind of people that live in this world, trusting that God will guide us, but enjoying the good fruits that he has left for us to enjoy. Yeah. Yeah. Make some noise for the joy of the Lord. Yeah. Yeah. And I say this about both you and I mean, yeah. because I met you guys when you were teenagers. Yeah. 
And uh, on page 154, I, I, I watched this happen. You said, as I matured in my faith, yes. I came to realize I could enjoy God not only in his word, but also in his world. Yes, yes, yes. As well. Yeah. And uh, I think sometimes as believers, even sometimes when we're young and zealous at certain moments, or we can get, or, or even old in the faith, you yeah. can get legalistic on things. And, and Christians can have fun. Yeah. You know, as long as it's in the boundaries of, of yeah. what God allows us to do, yeah. that's, that's not sinful or whatnot. But we can have fun. Yeah. We can have a good time. And I love what you say on 155. You said, I'm convinced there's always more to enjoy than there is to deny. Mm. And sometimes we get this wrong view of when we become a Christian that then there's just this long list of rules of all this stuff we can't do anymore. Right. I can't go clubbing anymore. I can't be drinking. I can't be sleeping. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can't. God just doesn't want me to have any fun. And it's like, it's almost like, you know, what you said. It was that one tree yeah. in the garden. Yes. You got all these other trees with all this great fruit yes. and all this stuff. Why do we want to go after the one thing? You, you know, how many of y'all got kids? You tell your kids not to do that one thing. Yeah. What do they want to go do? <laughs> Y'all with me, right? Yes, absolutely. Man, but That's I love good. it. I'm convinced there's always more to enjoy than there is to deny. And one other thing I want to touch on, man, and I give you a shout out last service that you are like a Randy Alcorn fan. Yes, I yes. didn't know that until I read the book. Uh -huh. And so Randy Alcorn is one of my, my favorite authors, and you quoted the book, Heaven. Uh, that book for me was a game changer. Yes, sir. Me too. Uh, mm -hmm. Both my mom and dad uh, went to be with the Lord. And I grew up in church. So we don't always hear a lot of sermons about heaven. We don't hear a lot of theology about heaven. We hear a yeah. lot of stories of I died and went to heaven. And this yes. is my book. And <laughs> yeah. you know, I'm not saying those are bad. Buy my but, book. But, uh, right. Yeah. But, but biblically, like th that book, Heaven, is a biblical theology. It pulls out different yeah. things that are in Scripture, little yes. nuggets and gems about this is what uh, heaven's going to be like. And yes. it's not going to be an eternal church service. Ooh, come on now. Some of y'all have ta been taught that in church. It's just going to be like, man, we're going to be there forever and ever. Church is and long. Sweet by and by. It's black church in all heaven. Right. Yeah. Go all day long. It's, yeah. We're going to be at church all day. I don't day. want that kind of Hungry church. Hungry and everything, right? No. <laughs> but listen, there will be times we worship God. And there will be gatherings and all those kind of things. But we're also going to be like doing things for the glory of God, yes. the things we're wired and we're passionate about. Some of you have passions and gifts inside of you, and you haven't, they haven't come to fruition in your life. Yeah. Um, don't have regret. You, you might be doing those things in eternity. Yeah. God might have wired some of those things for eternity. The, the, the thing you quoted on page 168 was yeah. like, you, you quoted the book Happiness by Randy Alcorn. He says, we'll be far happier in this life if we understand it isn't our only chance for happiness. Yeah, come on. And neither is it our best chance. Yes, yes, yes. We're going to have eternity to be doing all kinds of things and experience all kinds of happiness and joy. Say that. And, uh, man, that's some stuff to look forward to. That's powerful. Yes, yeah. absolutely. And I, I think we are to be the kind of people that reflect the kingdom that is coming. Think about what Jesus says yeah. uh, to, to, for how his disciples should pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom, done, be, thy, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Mm -hmm. So we are to be expressions mm -hmm. of that coming kingdom yep. that is filled with justice and love and diversity and care and kindness that we are to be the kind of, as Paul says, aroma of Christ in this mm. world. That when you get around her or you get around him, they kind of smell like this kingdom. They, 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 they sound like it. They, 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 it feels like it. When they get Together, they yeah. do stuff that happens in the kingdom. You know that the kingdom of darkness loves hunger. It loves yeah. poverty. It loves fatherlessness. It loves the lack of mentorship. It loves the lack of, lack of discipleship. When this church, like I saw backstage, the video of Love Our City, which is fire, you don't see that. I've, I've been in churches all over the world. This church does that well. In that, when crossover is at its best, it's people loving God, loving each other, and the world is being changed as a result. That it smells like the kingdom. It sounds like the kingdom when you're meeting the needs of people who are suffering from the darkness.
And I just want to continue to remind us that God eliminating sin is not him eliminating your joy. God getting rid of sin, having you turn from sin is so that you can experience joy uninterrupted. Sin is the worst thing about this world. It's the ugly thing that mingles with good things and flips it on his head. And, and it's the reason why you're supposed to, you, you can't enter a good relationship with somebody without leaving with being wounded and soul ties. God is giving you the cheat codes to preserve your happiness, not to stop it. And in the kingdom, oh my goodness, as Randy Alcorn uh, speaks to, in the kingdom, There will be no interruptions. The interruptions that we have now are temporary. Where we are headed, we want people to experience in how we're living right now. And that is the dangerous Christian life. Ultimately, you're bringing down where we will be, the culture of heaven, the destiny of all things. You're pulling it down into a world that desperately needs it. Amen. Come on, give it up for that dangerous Jesus. Yeah. Man, this book has blessed my life, bro. Mm. Uh, I finished it recently. Yeah. And uh, it's it's been powerful. Amen. And I encourage you guys. This is a, a great a, a great tool, great encouragement to help you grow in, in your faith, to remind you of some things, for God to put the spotlight on our hearts, and. Uh, I guess last thing, man, before I'm going to ask you to pray in a second, but yeah. what, what would you say, like, you really want people to walk away with, man, Yeah. with this, with this work? Yeah, I, I, I want you to know that that Jesus that met you in that dark place that you were in, the, the, the Jesus who you met that is transforming your life you didn't just go to, through a phase dear brother dear sister no that Jesus is alive right now seated at the right hand of the father praying for you accomplishing things for you preparing a place for you and he longs to connect with us in a way We've been waiting for the return of Jesus for over 2,000 years. And I, I wonder why those of us that are committed to this don't get tired of that. I heard an atheist the other day. Well, I just heard a dude the other day. He, he was an atheist, but he, sorry. I'm going to empty of his, him of his humanity. It was a person. Um, He talked about, man, y'all have been waiting for a long time. Where is Jesus at? That's what he said. And I wish I could have been there. Because what I would have said to him is, oh, Jesus hasn't returned yet. And we ain't tired of waiting because he walks with us every day. I'm hearing his voice. I'm seeing his work. I see his hand. You can't convince me that this isn't real. Believe that, dear brother, dear sister, and lean into that. And the last thing that I'll say, because I'm already over time. Sorry, the second if service. You, it's the second service. All right, y'all got to sleep in, so we're going to hang out a little bit. <laughs> if you do not have any idea what I'm talking about, who is this king of glory? Oh, I got good news for you. Talk about it. Jesus became... A man and he lived a life that none of us could live the life that in our hearts we know we should be but we can't pull it off in our own strength he did it all the way to a cross and on that cross he did business with God on your behalf God does not allow for evil and darkness to run rampant without doing something about it. One day, he will put all evil and all darkness away. There will be no more gang wars. There will be no more injustices. There will be no more racism. The 
He, it has an expiration date. But in this present evil age, we know what it's like to be oppressed by spiritual evil. Jesus did something about it. On the cross, he yeah. takes on everything that would take us into spiritual darkness forever. Jesus takes it on. And on the cross, he pays a debt. Yes. And God sees what the Son of God does. God, the Father, sees what Jesus does on the cross in suffering. All the anger, all the justice that would be poured out on us, it was poured out on the Son of God. And Jesus, in three hours, flips this cup over, as it were, and says, It is finished. No more debt. No more sin stacked against those who are falling under the thumb of the devil. No more. I got freedom now. Three days later, Jesus gets out of the grave and he turns to you and says, I have all power, all authority. You want to talk about hip hop's triad of success, money, power, and success, uh, and, and money, power, and respect. Jesus hops out of the grave with more resources than you can ever imagine. He can resource you in this life and for all eternity because he gives you the riches of righteousness. You want to talk about power? I don't care how rich you are. I don't care how much access you, ha you have. You could be the CIA. <laughs> Nobody has power like the Lord Jesus Christ because he beats death. Yeah, yeah. And then we're talking about respect. You want to be a respectable man, a respectable young woman. We live to try to wrap ourselves in the fig leaves of accolades and followers and, and to be seen like we somebody somewhere. You are somebody because God made you. And if you know Jesus, then you know someone who is so respected that every knee will bow, every tongue will agree that he is that guy. That's who Jesus is. And he says, and I am living to be that for you, to get all of that power and resource and respect into your life, into your family, into your city. And my invitation to you is come running to this. Come dive into this. Join the community where God will restore. He will heal. He will redeem. Oh, I always am struck by what Jesus said out of his own mouth. That I have not come to condemn the world. What? Yeah. We are often just the people, Christians, of condemnation. Mm -hmm. That's who we are. There are things to condemn. But do not forget, Jesus said that I have come in as Savior, yeah. as Lamb. Not primarily as the one to judge in this current time. Brothers and sisters, trust this Jesus and into the world of the kingdom. You pray for us, man. Yeah. Father, we come before the name of your son, Jesus. We thank you for your mercy, your kindness. Thank you for the invitation. You knock at the door, oh Lord. Lord, give us the hearts to open and then allow you in to arrange things how you want. We are better off when you are Lord, not when we are in control. Teach our slow hearts. Teach my slow heart, Lord, to love, embrace, and experience that. May your presence be acknowledged. May your power be seen through this series, through this church, in this city. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Yeah. Let's show some love to our brother KB. Come on, give it up for him today.